Chapter 9 The dragon's thoughts were confusing. They seemed to hop from one splash of gray to the next. Its mouthings were unformed as well, most of the time nothing more than the pipings of a new hatchling, as though it was almost mute. Can you get any sense of her? Aki asked. If you found out it's a her, then you're doing better than I am, Jacken said. I can feel the difference, idiot. By her head? Aki sighed. All this time with dragons, and you don't know a worm-eaten thing. Female dragons have a special ridge under the tongue. You can just barely feel it when they're not gravid, but it's there. It grows bigger to help with the egg-breaking if a hatchling birth bump can't do the job. Then it gets smaller again, after the hatching. I got all of that, but gravid. It means pregnant, Jacken, full of eggs. Honestly, I sometimes wonder about you. Jacken grunted. You have a lot of head knowledge, Jackie, but most of what I know comes from here. He tapped himself on the chest, and his sending was the diagram of a human with a pulsing red point in the center of the body. That's the stomach, worm waste. Your heart is higher and on the left side, she laughed. I know that, Jacken said quickly, but a moment later he joined in her laughter. Sensing the lightened mood, the dragon gave a remarkable imitation of a chuckle, deep-throated and near a thrum. For an instant, her mind seemed to clear, and Jacken caught a glimpse of her sending of a landscape so alien to him, he wondered if it was real. It was a dark hole in which hot, fiery liquids bubbled, and nearly naked creatures, in stooped parody of human beings, bent over the boiling pit. Then the scene was gone, replaced by the same jumble of greys. Man? Not man? The dragon asked again. Of course, man, Aki said. The dragon leaped up, knocking Jacken over with its tail as it stood and began to tremble. Oh, fumets! Aki cried. Jacken, do something! Jacken scrambled to his feet and put both hands on the dragon's back. The only other time he had seen a dragon tremble that much had been in the pit, when a defeated dragon had screamed until heart's blood began to shake in the tremors known as fool's pride. Such trembling usually led a dragon to forget all training and fight to the death. But a death wish was not what Jacken sensed from the cave dragon. He could read only total and overwhelming fear, so he willed himself to stand calmly, though he could feel sweat running down his back with the effort. Forcing the image that had always worked for him before, he sent a faded, grayed-out picture of the oasis where he and Heart's blood had trained, with its ribbon of blue river threading through the sandy landscape. But the dragon seemed unable to listen. Her own hot, bubbling fear images kept breaking into Jack and sending, boiling the gray-blue stream and turning the sand dunes into vast gray storms. Her trembling continued unabated. Man, 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 man. It was a kind of wail that ran through, around, under, and over the sending. I can't reach her, Jacken shouted to Aki, his voice bouncing off the walls. Either that or she can't hear. Maybe, Aki's voice was thinned out. Maybe the pictures you're sending make no sense to her. Try something else. She'd begun trembling herself with the effort of soothing the dragon. Jacken moved toward the dragon's neck and put his arms around her shaking head. He blew into her ears, trying to get her attention. Listen, little flame mouth, he crooned. I am not man. I am part dragon. I had two mothers. Trust me. Trust me. Think of the dark. Think of the quiet. Think of the not men. He forced cool, careful thoughts to her, stopping once to blow into her ears again, first the left, then the right. Then he started crooning again. I think, Aki began, I think she's trembling a little less. He nodded, keeping up his croon. He babbled about caves and night and the moons and anything else that he could think of but all the while he kept the sending as controlled as possible. She's definitely trembling less, Aki said. Even Jacken could feel it now, running his hand down the long neck where the scales, though shifting with small tremors, were moving more slowly. He doubled his effort then, sure of success. I will tell you a story now, he said, his voice even, about Fumit Sverkin, a fantastic fellow. He proceeded to tell the dragon seven jokes in a row without ever changing the tone of his voice. The important thing was to keep the words flowing. Next to the dragon's leg, Aki relaxed into a giggle. Jack and you're terrible, she said. But her mood, communicating directly with the dragon, helped even more. As Jack and began the eighth joke, he realized he couldn't think of any more and finished lamely. And that's all we know about Fumit's Firkin. But it was all right, for the dragon had stopped shaking. Jack and sighed. Now what is all this, he said softly, about not man. But the dragon, too, gave a tremendous sigh, lay down, and put her great head on her front legs and fell asleep. When you deal with hysterical babies, Aki said, you'll find a surprising phenomenon. They fall asleep the minute the crisis is over. Some baby, Jacken said. Big baby, Aki added. They laughed, 
remembering their conversation only a day before. So now we have an enormous sleeping dragon on our hands, Jackin began, and several enormous questions unanswered, Aki finished for him. Jackin was silent. One, Aki said, what is the difference between man and not man, and why did it scare her so much? Two, who is she, and where did she come from? Then, as if an afterthought, he added, she's certainly too big to have come in through our entrance, and... And if she came in elsewhere, where is elsewhere? asked Aki. Three, Jackin said. Who is she running from? That's easy. The thing, whatever it is, that eats dragons and stacks their bones in neat piles. Aki gave an exaggerated shiver. It translated into wavy lines that streaked through Jackin's head. Maybe, maybe not, Jackin said. But that leads us to question four, which is, If man frightens her, and not man doesn't, then is it man who's doing all the eating? We ate dragon meat before, Jackin said. They were both quiet for a moment, remembering... Maybe question five is, what's down there? Aki asked. Down where? Asked Jackin. Question six. Which direction is down there? Jackin squatted next to the sleeping dragon and put his back against the cave wall. Question seven is, do we go forward or do we go back? Aki knelt next to him. If we go back, we have to deal with the copter and whoever is in it. Jackin interrupted, and the fact that there's no other way down the mountain. She nodded. But if we go forward... We have to deal with the dragon's fear and the man-not-man -man thing that eats dragons and licks the bones clean and whatever else is in our sending that we didn't understand. Hot bubbly somethings and slope-shouldered creatures and... and But that's all unknown, Aki said. And maybe it's just in her imagination. Dragons don't have any imagination, Jackin said. They say only what it is. But we know what's back there. So the real question is... Numbers 8, 9, and 10, said Aki. Which is more frightening... What we know or what we don't know. The light world filled with copters and possible death or transportation? Or this gray world filled with... She stopped. There was a long moment of silence. Jackin tried to keep his mind blank, but it boiled with images. Finally, he whispered to her, though his mind sent ahead what his mouth had formed reluctantly. Both. They're both frightening. You choose. I'll do whatever you want. Hey! Aki whispered back. That's my line. Then we'll choose together. All right, Aki said. We'll go. Her mouth shut, but her mind spiraled down and down and down into the unknown dark.